Hello, my name is Gretchen Schweigert, and I will be discussing copyright law and how it has been affected by the internet. Now, I'll be going over a brief overview of some of the more recent issues that have arisen due to the uniqueness of the internet as well as how popular it's gotten in the last couple decades. So what exactly is copyright law? Plainly, according to copyright.gov, it literally is the right to copy. A law about copyright gives a creator of a work full rights to copy and distribute that work to their own desire. For the most part, each country has its own regulations regarding copyright laws, which is where it gets a little tricky now that the internet is involved. Prior to the internet and the World Wide Web, international access to copyrighted works was not as easily available. Now with a simple digital file, a copyrighted work can be accessed from across the world in a matter of moments. Copyright laws also have a few stipulations to go along with them. One example is fair use, meaning, to a certain extent, others who are not the original creator have a certain amount of access to a work's content for their own use within their own work. Another example is a limitation on the copyright. In the modern day, a copyright will expire for a good 70 years after a creator's death, and their work will become part of the public domain. Copyright laws also deal with specific details. It does not cover ideas, procedures, processes, slogans, principles, or discoveries. Okay, so a little bit of history before we get too, par too far into this presentation. The first statute regarding copyright law was the Copyright Act of 1709, which was passed in Great Britain in 1710. It is also known as the Statute of Anne, in honor of Queen Anne at the time. It was the first copyright law to be regulated by a government rather than a private business or person. Prior to this statute, the licensing of the Press Act of 1662 allowed the Printers Guild to allow or disallow the printing of a work. They were in charge of both distribution and censorship of the printed materials they created. The Statute of Anne specifically gave authors copyright of their works for 14 years, or 21 years if the work was published prior to the law being enacted. If the authors were still alive at the time of the copyright's expiration, they had the option to renew it. This brings us to the idea of fair use. Fair use is a complement to copyright law, a sort of opposite side of the coin. Fair use is what allows a transformed work to not be considered a violation of copyright law. Transformed works are works that are heavily influenced by others, whether they be originals like My Fair Lady, based on Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, or parodies like Saturday Night Live sketches. Fair use allows references to be used without having to contact the original creator, making the whole process much easier. Sometimes fair use might accidentally, or not accidentally in the case of plagiarism, cross the line of copyright infringement, in which case they are to be determined in a court of law on a case-by-case -case basis. There are really no set laws that govern fair use itself, it's more what is left unsaid by copyright law. If a case is brought before a judge when determining copyright infringement versus fair use, there are at least four components that are to be considered. One, purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Three, amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, F and four, effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. There are also some other things that are kept in mind, but they typically depend on the situation itself. The internet is not the first new bit of technology that has been a cause for concern regarding copyright laws and the threat of piracy. Even within, just within the last century alone, there have been numerous scares within the media. Usually it's in regards to a device that can record and or distribute work easily and privately, and people do in fact use these technologies to do what is feared, but for the most part it hasn't caused some major downfall of any major media type, although there have been reports recently of piracy negatively affecting the music industry. Some examples include the radio, especially once cassette recorders were introduced. The fear was that some people could record a song straight off the radio and play it whenever they wanted without the artist receiving any sort of compensation. The, the, fear, the same fear cropped up with reruns on the television and then exacerbated with the introduction of the VCR, which functioned similarly to cassette recorders. 
And then photocopiers caused the same concern for printed material, but we all know that restrictions were put into place about how much of a published work could be copied and distributed. As for the internet, all sorts of files, file downloads are cause for concern, especially TV shows that are only available on premium channels. But MP3 files are probably the first well-known case of piracy on the internet. Everyone probably remembers Napster and how it provided a platform for downloading music free of charge, which meant the artist got no compensation at all. It even sparked some prominent artists like Metallica to go to court against them. As illustrated earlier, copyright laws have had to be in response to new technology, so the work is never done. Several different laws have been created and presented in the past trying to regulate file sharing over the internet, and some have been more successful than others. One law that was actually passed was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of from 1998. A few others were not so successful. These include the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act. Both of these were eventually struck down for not being considered constitutional. The late 1990s saw a sharp increase in internet usage. In response to this, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was signed into law by President Clinton. This gave us many of the digital laws we are familiar with today, but even then Congress knew that laws regarding the internet would be ever-changing. Therefore, the DMCA is used as a platform for every subsequent digital-related legislation. Also due to this legal malleability, the report of the Register of Copyright is a supplementation to this law. Since the U.S. government has no power in regulating other countries' websites, it aimed to stop the access to these foreign websites instead. Eventually, it was found that SOPA's wording was too broad and vague to be considered constitutional. This vagueness, it was feared by many online businesses such as Google and Facebook, could potentially shut down many major websites due to the many international connections they have. Not surprisingly, the biggest proponents of this bill and PIPA were those who would be most negatively affected by online piracy, meaning the music and film industries. The Protect IP Act, better known as PIPA, was a bill that was similar to, the, to SOPA, but instead went through the Senate rather than the House of Representatives. Overall, it attempted to combat the same issues in a very similar manner, but it garnered less attention by the media and ended up getting further along in the legislation process than SOPA did. Due to its similarities to SOPA, it also did not make it all the way through the legislation process and never became a law either. Conversely, the Open Act was actually well received by many opponents of both SOPA and PIPA. It was more specific in places where both previous bills were too broad and seemed to be a sensible approach to internet piracy prevention. In spite of this, Open also met an unfavorable end, but Melise Attale, author of Regulating the Unregulable, 2014, claims its downfall was mostly due to being introduced so soon after SOPA and PIPA failed, and just being swept up in its predecessor's controversy. This doesn't mean that no future regulation will ever come about. Some law that protects a creator's work would certainly be a noble goal, and fortunately OPEN can set a respectable platform for such a law. Legislators could use what supporters favored about it, and perhaps one day there will be some sort of successful regulation regarding copyrighted works between digital international borders. Digital media and copyright laws are a double-edged sword for libraries. On one hand, the ease of access is unparalleled, but on the other, the cost can be detrimental. When it comes to physical items, libraries have what is known as the first sale doctrine. This means that they are in control of the item itself, whether it's a book, a DVD, a video, or whatever. While this doesn't mean they own the content, meaning the storyline or the characters, they do have control over the accessibility of the item. With digital media, however, First sale doctrine does not apply. Libraries instead pay for the access to the item, but they do not own the item itself. While this may seem like a very inconsequential difference, depending on the item or the company they're dealing with, it may become incredibly expensive. This is more the case with access to periodicals, specifically scholarly journals, but even simply an ebook uh, subscription can be problematic at times. 
while Napster might have been making copyright law headlines over a decade ago, currently the hot topic is the Google Books project, formerly known as Google Print or Google Book Search. Just recently, a federal appeals court ruled that the Google Books project is considered fair use under the clause of copyright law. Google Books is an ambitious project undertaken by Google in order to digitize every book ever and made available over the internet. Its primary goal is to make orphan books available to the public. Orphan books are books that are still under copyright, but the holders are indeterminable or unreachable. Often, these books are still under copyright but are no longer in print. Therefore, having them available digitally would be very beneficial to the public. Predictably, this project has raised some concerns over the copyright issues for the authors who are still in control of their work. Many are not happy with their work being put onto a website without their permission. This is a legitimate concern, but Google Books are, does not allow every bit of their work to be available digitally. Often, only a snippet of an author's work is available as a preview, and then the work itself is linked to a site that makes it available for sale, such as Amazon. This does not seem to be any different than a customer in a bookstore being able to quickly flip through a book's pages to figure out if they would like to purchase the book or not. It has been debated over Google Books whether to have an opt-out preference for, op for authors or to have an author specifically contact Google to make their work available for the project. There are some pros and cons to both approaches. In order to have an opt-out preference, every author must be informed of this option, which might not be considered feasible. However, the option of needing an author's consent negates the purposes, purpose of making the orphan works available as their creators are unable to be located. Google Books was recently determined to be legal due to its status as a public service. Because the work included is a scanned and then put through character recognition software to make them more searchable, it was determined that the project made the works transformed, which put them under fair use terms rather than copyright infringement. Thank you for watching this quick seminar on copyright law and the internet. Here are some sources for some more in-depth information on the subject.